Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for coming out. Uh, before I start, I'd first off like to apologize. I am coming off of a cold, so if I sound a bit funny or if I'm coughing a lot during this, I do apologize. Uh, first off, what I want to say is uh, thank you to each and every one of you guys for all your prayers and support that you guys gave me. Really do appreciate it. Uh, all the financial support could not have done it without you, and all the prayers, it really did mean a lot. And all the people checking in on me uh, during my time there, yeah, it really meant a lot, and I want to thank you guys for that. Um, and also, it's kind of hard to get six months of a lot of stuff happening into 45 minutes. So if it seems like I go a little bit long, I'm sorry. And if it seems like I'm brushing over some stuff that I should go deeper into, uh, yeah, I'm trying to cover all my bases here um, tonight. So I kind of want to first start off with talking about the refugee crisis and kind of why it started and um, just kind of like a little bit of background so everybody knows what's up and kind of what's happening there. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's not too important. But um, yeah, here's a little bit of a map of showing. It's a little bit dark. You can't really quite see what it says. But um, this is kind of a map of the Middle Eastern refugee crisis. There's uh, a bigger one in Asia happening, but this is primarily the Middle Eastern one. Uh, we have primarily the um, Afghans, Syrians, and then Somalians down here. And there are a few other countries that are mixed in here. Congolese would also be a big part. But for the most part, it's those four countries that make up a primary part of this refugee crisis. And it kind of all started in 2011 um, with the start of the Syrian civil war. Uh, there was a lot of unrest in both Syria and Iraq because of ISIS was there and then the civil war started. And so that kind of forced a lot of Syrians to flee their country up into Europe um, for a better life. A lot of them had no choice. Um, they also couldn't really go over into Iraq, which you can't really see Iraq on the map here. It's white, but of course it's right there, um, because ISIS was also over there and there's not a lot of options for them. So they would make a trek up through Turkey um, and then make a boat, boat ride across. Lesbos is right there. Um, so they would take a boat ride across and stay on Lesbos for a couple weeks. Then they'd take a ferry probably to Athens, stay there a couple weeks, and apply for asylum at the next country, then travel on to the next country, apply for asylum, and keep traveling on until they're the destination country of, what they, of where they really want to go to, oftentimes Germany or France or somewhere up there. And then uh, Afghanistan and Somalia and all these other small countries kind of saw the opportunity to leave their countries and get to a better country, um, a better European life, a better life for themselves. And so they also left, made the long trek up through, through Turkey and across on the boat. Um, they usually have to pay a smuggler probably around 8,000 euros, which not exactly sure how much, how much uh, dollars that is, but for one person to come across on the boat, uh, it's about a three hour long boat ride from the border of Turkey to the, to the island of Lesbos. And it's not only Lesbos, it's also Chios and Samos. Those are two other islands, but Lesbos is the biggest island with the biggest refugee camp. Um, and so the refugee crisis reaches peak in about 2015, and then about a year later, 2016, a lot of European countries started closing their borders and decided basically that they're not going to start letting a lot, very many more refugees in, mainly because there's so many trying to get in and it was just kind of a, a big mess with, uh, they saw a lot of them as a threat. And so that kind of forced a lot of refugees to now be stuck on these islands for months. And I've met a couple guys who were going on two years of being, on the, of being in these camps. And just because they apply for asylum in these countries, and it just takes that long for them to get accepted into these countries or get uh, their asylum process kind of taken care of. And so that's kind of how it's been since 2016, 2017, um, of just them sitting and waiting on a process that they're never even sure is going to happen. They might be deported. They might they might be sent back to Turkey, which would then send them back to their other country. So a lot of these refugees aren't even necessarily refugees. A lot of them are migrants. Um, it's kind of a toss up of which one it is. Um, there are a lot fleeing war, fleeing unrest and stuff, but then a lot of them are simply looking for a better life. Um, 
So originally, a lot of the uh, a lot of the refugees in these camps were Syrian, but lately it's actually primarily Afghanistan. Uh, a lot of the Syrians have decided to more move into refugee camps in Iraq, uh, Lebanon, and Jordan because closer to home, other Arabic speakers, and they don't necessarily want to leave their home, but they're kind of forced to, and they go to refugee camp a little closer to home, mainly with the hopes of returning to Syria one day after the war is done. So about 70% of the people in camp now are Afghan, and then Syrians make up the other bigger part, and then goes Somalia and Congo from there. Um, and I was also told that I should really read a couple of the stories of a couple of these people, and I'm gonna actually do that. It's a wonderful book that I'm gonna advertise at the end of this <laughs> talk. Um, I'm gonna read these out of. And <clears throat> the first story I wanna read is, her name is Fatima, uh, she's from Afghanistan. And this is, uh, somebody did kind of a, um, kind of like an interview with her. Anyways, uh, Fatima is 32 years old and left with her husband, Ali, and their five-year-old son. Ten months ago, I left Iran, and eight months ago, I came to Moria. So she's been in Moria for probably about eight to ten months now. But the war started long ago, uh, when I was a kid myself. One night, the Taliban knocked at our door, and my mother didn't open the door because my father wasn't home. So they put a ladder behind the house and got onto the roof and climbed into the house. They hit my big brother and my mother with the back of the gun, it was very early in the morning, and they kicked us out of our house. After that, my family mi migrated to Iran. About a year ago, my son became very sick, and the hospital refused to help my child because we weren't Iranian. We, w we only had a refugee ID card. I wasn't, looking at my, I wasn't looking at my child dying, or I was looking at my child dying, and at that moment, we decided to migrate. I don't want my child to ever see what we have seen. So that's actually a big part of it, is Afghans are not treated well in Iran. It's where a lot of them migrate to, because <clears throat> it has a better standard of living, but they're not treated very well. They're treated like dogs, they're treated like second-class citizens. Um, that's why a lot of them move on into Europe. And I want to read one more story. Uh, his name is Emmanuel, and he's from the Congo. Uh, he's 27 years old and a single man living without a family in Moria. He was participating in movements to, to oppose the president and to re receive human rights in his country. After that, he got kidnapped by men in mass who, weren't me who were members of the government, and they took me to a house in the middle of nowhere. They tortured me, hit me, and did things I can't bring myself to share with anyone. I was able to run away and had to leave without saying goodbye to my family because the government, meant before, because the government knew where I lived. I've lost everything I had. All my plans and projects are canceled, and I never wish to be in Greece today or, or I dream of coming here for a holiday but never as a refugee but I don't regret coming here, because even though the conditions are terrible, I'm at least safe here, I'm protected. Uh, those are just a couple stories, and there's so many different stories, so many different reasons people come. Um, I had a couple minor boys in the section that I was working in in camp. Uh, he was about 15, I would say. His brother was about 12, 11, 12. Um, the only family they had in camp was an uncle, and they're over there because in Afghanistan, the, ta uh, the Taliban uh, attacked their village or something like that, and both of his parents were killed in that, in that fight, and so he was forced to flee, um, s terribly young boys. Um, and now they're living <coughs> without a family, without, without a home, and yeah, the 15-year-old probably really feels pretty responsible for what happens with the, with the younger one. Um, so yeah, kind of forced into that situation, v very sad. Um, but then, of course, there is a bunch of, bunch of refugees being converted, and I'll talk about it a little bit later when we talk about that. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, about I-58, kind of how it was started. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe. Maybe not. Well, uh, till yes. Ah, uh, gotcha. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, actually, before that, we have some nice scenery pics. 
This is Mytilene, where the, the capital of Lesbos right now. Um, it's a very pretty city. And you have the uh, very famous Greek Orthodox Church. They're very, very elaborate. They're like Catholics on steroids. So, <laughs> um, This is very popular. Uh, the cafe is very little legroom at the tables that they have, but most of the times you would eat outdoors because it was usually warm enough. Um, and of course you have the little heater thing here for even in the winter you could sit outdoors. Um, yeah, very cute cafes there. Um, graffiti was a big part of Greece. Um, couldn't go anywhere without seeing lots of graffiti. Athens was very full of it. And I shoved this picture in here because <clears throat> it kind of shows very well the, um, the island of Greece or island of Lesbos because um, it's a very poor island actually there is there's a man there with I-58 who is from a little in northern Greece on the mainland. And the very general view of people on this island is they're kind of like the rednecks, the rednecks of Greece. Very, um, it's also a very poor island. Um, and so this was kind of how a lot of Greece looked. It was rocky and a little bit trashy, or not Greece, um, Lesbos. And yeah, it was just not the best kept up island where, where the tourists didn't go. Um, so this is how a lot of it looked. And this is the bay in Panayuta where we stayed, or where our little town was. A big fishing, fishing uh, village there. Um, <clears throat> talking about I-58, I-58 was started in January of 2016. There was a group that went over in 2015 to kind of look at the, look at the situation and see if there was a need or if they really wanted to get involved, and they decided um, after 2015 that they really did. It was a very big need for it. So they, so they started in 2016, uh, sent one family over there, or one family and a few other volunteers, and basically how they started was they set up a little table across from the camp, since they weren't allowed in. Camp is a government um, or a military base right now. So they set up a little table across from camp and set up some, some tea and would make tea uh, every day. And they would just serve it to any a uh, refugee who came out of camp and, or anybody that wanted some. And that was just kind of their way of, of serving. They couldn't really go into camp, give them food, give them what they needed, but they would set up a little, little table and give them tea and stuff. And after a lot of pleading uh, and asking for the go to the government, they finally let these, this family in to camp um, if they would clean the bathrooms. That was their job in camp. They would go and clean the bathrooms, and, but that was it. Like, they, couldn't, they couldn't do anything else. And if, yeah, if you ever go to this camp, it's, the bathrooms are not a fun place to be at. Uh, very stinky, uh, very, very nasty. But this family went in there and they cleaned the bathrooms. They said, if, if that's our job, these are gonna be the cleanest bathrooms in Greece. Um, and, and they were. <laughs> and so probably a few months after that, they, uh, Euro Relief um, is the organization that I-58 is now under. Um, they, they saw them working in camp and they decided, or they asked them, I'm not sure which one approached which, but basically I-58 got in contact with Euro Relief and agreed to send its volunteers into camp uh, as Euro Relief volunteers. And a little bit about Euro Relief is they're, <clears throat> they're under the organization of Hellenic Ministries, which that is a Greek uh, mission kind of. Um, and the reason that they now have another organization called Euro Relief is because Hellenic Ministries is strictly Christian, and to be able to work inside of a camp in Greece, a refugee camp, you're not allowed to be labeled as Christian. You're not allowed to have that in your website anywhere because witnessing inside of camp is against the law. You're not allowed to do that. And so they basically broke off, created their uh, second organization under them that was not Christian, and so now they can go into camp with the same Christian morals and Christian uh, ideals, just not labeled as such. And <clears throat> so that was kind of how your relief was created there. And I-58 now, when you're outside of camp, you're, you're I-58 volunteer. But if you're inside of camp, you have a your relief vest and a badge on, you're your relief, you're, you're not I-58 anymore. So they started working under your relief probably late 2016, early 2017, and been as your relief ever since. Um, I-58's goal kind of is just to one, share the love of Christ with the, with the Muslims coming through the, through the country and also just to provide the humanitarian aid that they're able to in, inside a camp. And there's kind of a twofold um, 
mission of I-58. Uh, the, the one mission would be, of course, the working camp. Um, and here's a few pictures of the camp. It's uh, very crowded, or was very crowded. Of course, this is the old camp. This camp no longer exists, uh, which I'll get into later. Um, so it's very, very crowded. And of course, you can see um, these here. We're standing on top of an ISO box, which I'll show later. And here's just a row of tents. There's a fence, another row of tents, and then more buildings. Um, so there's not intended for any of those tents to be there. And at this time, there's probably about 20,000 people in camp, close to 20,000, about 19,000. And camp was originally, was originally built for 2,000. And so now there's about five to 6,000 inside of camp, inside the walls, and about, do the, do the math, I can't actually do the math right now, probably 12 to, shoot, the rest were outside of camp. And so, <laughs> and so, and so yeah, the, the population outside of camp was a lot bigger, actually. But um, just a very crowded, crowded place. Uh, this, is, this is an ISO box. Those are probably the nicest places in camp. Um, and in between these ISO boxes, as you see, there's just people setting up tents, makeshift tents and stuff, because there's nowhere else necessarily to live. They'd rather live inside of the fences of camp rather than in the jungle, is what we call outside of camp, uh, just because it's safer inside and more police presence. Um, here's looking down once again. Uh, originally, no tents or any or structures inside this area. And yeah, there are now. And inside these tents, there would just be people set up blankets as dividers and have their family in maybe a corner of this, of this building. Then here's like the bathrooms over here and stuff. So not a lot of privacy either. Um, but they do, they do manage to make it their home and they do manage to uh, thrive actually in this, in this camp. Um, here this gentleman set up a produce stand with, uh, with the money that he gets every, every POC gets a little card when they get over and they, or I should say refugee, um, and they get a certain amount of money each, each month on that card and they use that money to, uh, uh, this guy uses it to buy fruit and then he sells it to either other refugees or organizations that want it and he makes money with it. Um, also in the back you can see a uh, common structure that they built. They build it out of wood and then they cut, out, cut up their old tent for the tarp and strap the tarp over top of it so that the rain doesn't get in. It gets very rainy in the winter seasons. This is a barber shop in camp. Uh, very many, a lot of barber shops. Um, this is actually a I-58 guy getting a, getting a haircut done. Get a very cheap haircut done, but it's usually pretty good. Um, yeah, they just go to town, buy the supplies they need off the money that they get and go to work. Um, the food in camp is amazing. Uh, that's the one, those are wings roasting over charcoal right now. That's them, uh, best, best food I've ever eaten. And this is the main, main hill in camp once again. Um, this guy in front is selling pots and pans and shoes that he bought in town. And there's people, you can see, you can find phones in camp. If you wanna buy a phone, you can buy a phone in camp. You can buy batteries, you can buy, of course in the back they have bread being sold. And then way in the back, back in here, it's just a structure built and they're built and they're selling pop in there and they're selling anything you want, chips, stuff like that. So you never have to pack a lunch, you can always just buy. Um, here's another picture, the guy's selling produce. Um, yeah, just a few. It, you could probably fit four guys in that tent. There are probably four guys living in that small little tent right there. Um, three to four probably. Safety in numbers. Um, yeah, but then there's always happiness for some. Nobody knows where it comes from, but there's always happiness then in, in places that feel so hopeless. Uh, you walk into camp and you kind of get a hopeless feeling at first, uh, your first time in camp, but then immediately followed after that is just everybody smiling at you. And it's just this strange sense of, of happiness for some reason. The kids are always running around playing. They're not sitting down. Um, moping or crying, they're always smiling. You'll get smiles from the refugees cr passing you by even though they're probably the worst time in their life. Um, but yeah, you'll always get, you always get a smile. Um, this is kind of overlooking camp. You're kind of in the far back corner. Uh, 
yeah, you can see tents are all the way down here, all the way over in, into here, and then main camp would be over in this area, which isn't really in the picture. And when I say main camp, I mean like the camp inside the fence, the original camp, the, not the outside here. Um, and best bread you'll ever eat, probably. Um, so that's the first, uh, that's the first mission that I-58 has. The second mission uh, would, would be the Oasis, so that's kind of twofold. The Oasis is, from this old camp, it was probably about uh, three to five miles away, um, a couple hours walk for the, for the refugees. And it was basically just a place that refugees could go and they would uh, serve them tea. I actually have pictures, here it is. Uh, they would just serve them tea and uh, like cookies and stuff like that. And then on the tables they would have like, a, like literature, uh, Bibles and different stuff that, uh, different stuff in their language that they could read. And then basically volunteers would just walk around and either fill up their tea or sit and talk and chat and stuff. And this was a really good time to hear people's stories and to share the love of Christ. And if they didn't talk English, you would of course have lots of, uh, lots of translators walking around, Christian translators um, that, would, that, that would sit with you and, and help you and stuff like that. Um, but it was also really nice to, yeah, try to struggle through that language barrier, learn a few words in Farsi, and they would learn a few words in English. It was, it was just a good time to, time to get to know some people. Um, and there was a shelf in the back where we would have Bibles and stuff. And it's also where we'd have our church. Uh, church services weren't strictly I-58. It was basically anybody who wanted to come. Uh, it was I-58 would always come, and then Your Relief would always come, since most of the Your Relief volunteers were also Christian from places like Europe, uh, Canada, and not a lot of Americans for some reason. Uh, not sure why. But, and then all, of, the, of course, the POCs in camp or the refugees in camp would... Uh, would also come. And a lot of them could not necessarily speak English, but you would also, but you would always have a translator up front talking about, uh, or translating into Farsi for the Farsi speakers, since that was the biggest language that was speak, spoken. And then if you would have like Arabic speakers or French speakers, you would usually have like, just like a one-on-one -on -one translator who would sit with them and quietly translate for them um, uh, while, uh, while the speaking was going on. Also, if you would have a Farsi translator or a Farsi speaker, uh, the translator would translate into English for all the English-speaking people. Um, See, so yeah, I was usually pretty full, and we would sit, to, yeah, on the ground, did not have benches or anything. You can see the speaker up, and then translator is translating for him. Um, and yeah, baptisms happened quite a bit, actually which is really nice um, or really encouraging. And really, it's a lot, yeah, this picture speaks a lot of words and their willingness to do this because at this time it's January in Greece and it's very cold and they're in the sea, which is even colder. And, pe and the, some guys would go out there without a shirt on and you would just full immerse them and I don't know how they did it, but if I would stick a toe in, it'd probably turn blue. <laughs> but, but it was very cold, but, but they would all go out there and they would they would get ba uh, yeah baptized and it was just yeah a cool thing to to go and watch and the oasis was also a place where <clears throat> you could where there was bible studies there was english classes and um oh, there was one more thing they did i'm not wasn't very big but yeah those were the two main things or the two main other things and it wouldn't all be i58 there would be another organization doing english classes and then a Farsi Christian would be doing a, a Bible study for the, for the Farsi speakers. Discipleship training was the other one uh, that they would do. Once, once a refugee would become a Christian, they would put him through like a short uh, discipleship training and then take him out and baptize him when they're, when they're ready. <clears throat> uh, the, if any of you know anybody from Greece, you would know about the brick. Everybody talks about the brick. And it's not just a brick, it's made out of brick, but it's a, the kind of the hangout place for Greece, or for I-58. And typically we wouldn't have like other Euro Relief volunteers. We would often invite other Euro Relief volunteers to, um, to the brick for like an evening or something if they were good friends. But typically it was strictly a, 
strictly a, an I-58 place. Um, it's where we'd hang out, it's where we'd have supper. Supper was always at like six o'clock, and then you'd hang out usually till curfew, playing games, doing whatever. Some people would leave and go out to eat, go play volleyball, stuff like that. But yeah, um, this is typically a lot of volley or a lot of spike ball was played here. Um, and over here was the kitchen. So uh, that's where most of the, a lot of memories are made. Um, <clears throat> Then the rest of the volunteer, or there would be about seven, seven-ish guys that could stay at the brick upstairs. There were bedrooms. Then the rest would stay in apartments that were about a block away from the brick, um, a s small apartment complex. Um, that's, this is camp from an aerial picture or aerial view. Um, so basically, main camp, it's kind of blurry. It's a very bad picture. I'm not sure what it was taken as. But basically, main camp was this part right here. This was a fenced-in area that was originally all the, where the refugees could stay. But then when too many people came into camp, they started cutting holes in this side of the fence, and all of this was put in, all of, this, all of these tents. This was taken probably in August of 2019, and then in, I believe it's January of 2020, this picture was taken, same, same view. Here's inside of camp, and there's the little area that they had built out here. And then in those several months, all of these tents were built. And there's more out here, and there's more out here. So in that little fall, winter time, a lot of people came. A lot of people came over, and not a lot of people were transferred out. So that was kind of a time when, um, yeah, a lot of hopelessness was probably built because nobody was getting transferred out and a lot of people were coming. Um, and the volunteers were very busy during that time too, trying to get everybody housed and everybody in good spots. And then this is also a picture of camp. I'm not gonna spend a too, too much time on it because uh, not that important, but basically this was the main, main, main gate in camp. And then this is where your relief would work out of. Uh, this would be our main spot and then this would be the new arrivals area where the, where the new arrivals would be brought. And then this would be like the safe zones. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so your relief was typically in charge of, um, actually before I get to that, we would often um, take tea and just take it to random tents, just walk around camp, take tea and serve it to, uh, serve it to POCs on cold days. Um, they're very appreciative of that. Um, so your relief role on camp was typically um, housing. That was, that was the main job of your relief. There's, other or, there's a lot of other organizations that do a lot of other stuff, but the job of your relief was housing. There's about 12 zones in camp, and your relief was in charge of housing about nine of them, nine to 10 of them. Uh, other organizations were kind of taking over outside of camp, but it was typically your relief. And so basically what would happen is when new arrivals would come in, um, they would go up to where your relief is and we would give them a tent, depending on how big their family was. If there was a small family, we would give them a smaller tent, tell them to go out, set it up somewhere, come back, tell us where you put it, because you, you, <laughs> you just don't have the resources to send a volunteer out, put up the tent for them, and then come back. Because it was usually pretty late at night when they would start going out, or like when they, you would give them the tent. And so, um, if it was a bigger family and you, would give it, you were giving them a bigger tent, you would often uh, send a couple of volunteers out with them, setting up the, set up the tent for them, and then come back. But typically it was kind of a, you give them the tent and they go set it up for themselves. Um, and a couple of the other jobs that your relief would do was, would be send volunteers out um, on mapping is one, where you would basically go out, figure out with a, with a map of, uh, of like a certain zone, and you would make sure all the tents were in the spot that they were on the map. And if they weren't, you would mark where it moved to and go back and change it in, your, in the system, computer system. And which people moved their tents all the time, or they took down their tent and built a structure with wood, and then just put their tent kind of on the top so you could see the number of the tent on it. And so mapping was kind of, kind of a fun job because you got to do inter like meet people and make interactions and you weren't kicking people out of their houses and stuff like that. But you could go and make interactions and it was kind of fun. And then another job was census, which is kind of similar. You, you basically are going and making sure people are living in the tents that they're registered to. 
So you have a list of people or a list of tents and who's registered to that tent, and you go and make sure people are living in the right ones, and if they're not, then you just change it or figure out what's happening and try to sort it out. And probably the biggest role of your relief in camp is trying to find housing for vulnerable people. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of vulnerable people, a lot of vulnerable families um, in camp, and a lot of old people, young people, single people, stuff like that. Um, that deserve better housing and wouldn't really be smart to just have them in a tent far out in the jungle, far away from everybody, um, which if I didn't mention it, the jungle is what we call the outside of camp. It's like you have main camp and then you have the jungle outside of camp, outside of the, just because it looks like a jungle when you're out in it. Um, and it's a little bit more dangerous out in the jungle, a lot of more robberies and uh, stabbings happen out there. So it's a little more dangerous to for vulnerable people to be living out in the jungle. And so your relief would have this uh, like list of vulnerable people. So when an ISO box, this is actually an example of an ISO box right here. Um, yeah, so like when an ISO box would open up, or like space in an ISO box, you would you send a volunteer out to these families, offer them the space, and then if they take it, great. If they don't, then you go on to the next family. And usually how it worked was by the time you got to the family that wanted the ISO box, another family who didn't need the ISO box had saw that this ISO box is empty and so they had moved their stuff in. So then you usually kind of battled with that family to try to get them to move out so that this other family can move in and it usually didn't work. <laughs> but yeah, that was a lot of what your relief would do. Um, this is a very good example of how they would uh, divide the ISO boxes. They would just string up blankets. And so usually that, that was probably a family that was living in, the, in that back part there. Probably a family, small family, but um, that was all the space they had and that was all the privacy that they had, just that blanket right there. Um, this is kind of a, this is a bit of a bigger tent. This, this wouldn't be a family tent. This would m more be a um, Probably a single single person's tent where a lot of single men would stay. Um, looks like we're just putting in pallets there. Um, pallets were a big part and they would often get stolen because everybody wants pallets. Um, another thing that your relief often did, did was just odd jobs of cleaning up and making things look better, better around camp. This is a ditch in camp that was very full of trash, as you can see. Um, just tons of trash. So they sent probably about five volunteers down there one shift and cleaned it up. And that's all the trash bags that they filled up. Um, it stretches all the way back to there. A lot of trash. And then this is the ditch after they were done with it. So um, looks a little bit cleaner there. Um, so yeah, that was also kind of what your relief, or your relief would do. But then after they did that, probably about a month later, it was looking back like how it originally was. Um, there's no trash cans in camp. so. What do you do with your plastic? You just throw it off to the side. You just throw it to the ditch because somebody else will clean it up. I'm not here for that long anyways. So that was, a, that was kind of the mentality of camp. Um, your relief was also in charge of safe zones or a couple of the safe zones, section B and section C. Um, section B was primarily for unaccompanied minor, uh, minor boys. So it had room for about 160 to 180 of them. I'm not sure the exact number, but about how many boys could fit in that safe zone. And the reason it's a, kind of a safe zone, even though it's a dangerous camp, is because it was inside a couple gates. You usually have police station close by, outside, and it's usually locked at night. And you can't get in unless you have a card. And so a lot of the minor boys would be in section B, and then the section C was for vulnerable women. And uh, once again, not sure how many people, how, many, how much room that had for vulnerable women, but it was enough to make a small difference. And once again, uh, their tasks would vary throughout the day. Um, a lot of what Section B volunteers would do, there'd be two, two men um, stationed or put there every day, and it was usually their job, like they would go to Section B every day uh, that they were on shift, um, and basically just play with the boys, um, kind of like a, almost like a babysitting role. You would take them to the doctors, you would, you would uh, serve them food, you would, yeah, whatever, whatever you do as a parent, that's what these two guys had to do for about 160 some boys um, every day. And Section C was a lot, a lot the same way, just with women. Two, two women would be stationed there and um, 
yeah, uh, that would be kind of their, their job for their time in Greece. Um, then, of course, there's new arrivals. Um, this is where I was, this is where I was put, and there's kind of two, two jobs for new arrivals. Uh, the, the first job was, of course, with the new arrivals. When a new arrival, when like a new boat would come to the shore, it would come probably to like the north of, like the north, uh, the north side of the island, and then the police would bust them down to the camp. And when they were in the camp, when they were getting processed by the Greeks, we would go over and do kind of what we would, like size the boat is what it's called. We'd figure out how many people are in the boat. It's usually about 40 to 50 people. On, on one boat, and we would go to each family, and they usually didn't know much English, and we usually didn't know much uh, Farsi or whatever nationality this was. So we would try as best possible to figure out how many people are in their family, how, how big of clothes they wear, like their shoes, how old their children are, so that then you can go back to the new rival's uh, cage, and this is, the, this is the cage, or we call it the cage, um, like the building that we would stay in. And then you would pack from this area, you would pack bags for each family. Um, of, there's some towels, sleeping bags, blankets. Um, we would pack them in those bags. And then uh, bundles of clothes. So, so everybody would get like one bundle of clothes, each, each person. And then various other stuff, hygiene kits, stuff like that. All packed in one bag. And then, and then they would come later that night or the next night with a little ticket saying which, which bag they get. Um, all the bags are numbered. And so you would give them their bag, and then, yeah, uh, they would each, they would, they would, or each family would get one of those. And the second role that uh, New Rivals kind of plays is since camp is so big and so many people there, <coughs> uh, Section B does not have enough room for all the minor boys that are in camp. So in camp, when I first got there in January, uh, there are about 700 unaccompanied minor boys in New Rivals. Um, that's all the boys that could not fit into Section B because Section B was full. And so there was about 700 minor boys in New Rivals because that was the other so-called safe area in camp <coughs> that the Greeks could house people in. And so the minor boys would be put into a section or into New Rivals, and, we, and it would be kind of our job to kind of do the same thing as Section B and just um, hang out with them, solve any problems, uh, serve them breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that was kind of our job. There's some of the minor boys. Um, and this is kind of an example of we, that's the front of our cage. We would put that down every night and kind of to deter people from stealing. But one morning we got into the camp and that padlock was broken off. That entire cage was bent up, so like it was bent in half and the window was broken through and they had broken and stole some stuff. So, I mean, it was a good idea, but it didn't really work. But, um, but yeah, it's, they have a lot of time on their hand, and they get ideas, very mischievous. Um, and, yeah, it comes with its blessings, and it comes with its hardships. Um, it's, very, it's fun to be able to hang out with the boys, make that relationships, and just play games with them. Um, yeah, they would often hang their heads inside the, in the window, play chess, play Uno. They would teach you their own games and stuff, and, and you would just play with them, play some soccer out in the, in the little area that you have. Um, but then you, of course, have the fights you have to break up with, and, or break up, and you have to, um, yeah, solve any problems uh, that they have. And a lot of them become very mischievous, and one, one evening, me and, I'm, I'm not sure what got them mad or what got them in a tizzy, but, um, after we got done serving them uh, supper, I think it was because like the like the food came a little bit late. But after we got done serving them supper, um, they proceeded to take all the eggs that they had gotten with their meal and just start chucking them at the at the cage. And so we basically just stood inside the cage until they were done, until they kind of ran out of eggs. And so we went out and started cleaning it up and stuff. And they were, and a few of the minor boys hopped in and helped us and apologized and stuff. But <clears throat> and then. And, and these are hard-boiled eggs, not like regular raw eggs. Um, and they had a few left, so they started chucking them at us. And I wasn't scared or anything. It was just annoying to be cleaning up these eggs, and they just keep chucking them at you. Um, yeah, so it comes with its frustrations. And there would always, uh, with these minor boys, with all the stuff that they have uh, going on in their life, they would oftentimes go out and get drunk, and then they would come back 
and either cause a scene or just be an emotional wreck for you. So uh, you either start a fight or you just have to sit there and talk to them and they would just be crying and, and, and talking to you. And so it came with its, its struggles, kind of. Um, but it, in all, all in all, it was, it was a big blessing to be able to work with these guys, with these kids. A lot of relationships were made. He was a big troublemaker. Um, and they would often uh, invite you into, your, into their tents for food. Um, and it was usually good food. They would, they would I think what, what's in the pot is, I think, potatoes, tomatoes, and then some eggs all mixed together with some olive oil. And they somehow made it good. Um, and even though you had just gotten done eating, you had to go to their tent because that was the right thing to do. And also you want to spend time with them. Um, and if you didn't eat all the food they give you, it was very impolite. So you had to just figure out where to shove it. And, and <laughs> you managed. But... Uh, I hope the audio works with this. Um, but this is kind of an example of what they would do at night. Since they didn't really have a lot of stuff to do, they would simply play music and, uh, and dance. Yeah, that was a lot of what, what would their, your evenings would be spent with. And the music was a lot louder than, than you hear on there. They would have it very loud. There would be people on the other side of camp that you would get back to, uh, to the brick, and they would say, like, like, so like, were the boys playing music tonight? Because I heard it all, like, like, all across camp and stuff. So they would play it very loud. Um, but the cops never came to tell us to turn it down, so that was good. Um, this is the life jacket graveyard um, on the north side of camp. This is where they put all the life jackets and boats that they cut up. Um, it's a lot bigger than it looks there. Um, and th this is a story I can't really get into too much. Um, the, there were a bunch of protests on the island, the Greeks. They were protesting both the, uh, all the volunteers. They were protesting the refugee camp and the refugees. Um, and so... I-58 and actually a lot of the NGO organizations got, a lot, got quite a few threats. Um, and so we were actually in lockdown for about a week, week and a half probably. And our vans got smashed in um, the one day. So actually I think three, two or three of our vans got smashed in. The rest we kind of parked somewhere else to, to, to hide so that they wouldn't. Um, yeah, it was kind of a rough time in our time there. Um, all right, fast forward several months. And the second... My second trip to Greece in September. Um, we're running out of time, but I'll try to rush through this. Um, the, we got there in September. We quarantined for a week, and uh, we were supposed to quarantine for two weeks, but we got out about a week early because we all took a, took a test and we all came back negative. So we all got out a week. We got out on Monday, and uh, Tuesday, we took our tour through camp, Tuesday morning, and then Tuesday night, um, Inner camp burned down. Uh, the fire, you can't actually see it on the map or on the top, maybe you can on this one. Yeah, there you can see. There's the glow of the fire. Um, that's actually the second night that it burned. But the first night, uh, inner camp <coughs> burned down inside the, camp, in, inside the, the fence. And so, <coughs> excuse me, on, uh, on Wednesday then, we uh, basically didn't really know what to do. Uh, we all knew that camp was never going to be the same and that uh, stuff was happening that, yeah, we didn't know what was going to happen. We kind of felt hopeless, help, uh, helpless all in one. And um, so that day we, we went, we knew that there were thousands of, uh, thousands of refugees that were homeless on the streets. And so we went to the Oasis and got all the, um, all the, all the water that we could find and all the food. And we kind of packaged it up and just found random groups of refugees and um, just gave them water. Uh, we probably passed out a little over a thousand bottles of water that day, which is, wasn't enough, but it was all that we could do. Um, and then, yeah, that day was just filled with just praying and sitting and waiting, um, not knowing what's happening. 
Then Wednesday night, uh, the rest of camp burned. As you can see, the glow of camp, which is, we were all on the roof of the apartments that night, and it's kind of a, kind of a weird feeling looking over across and seeing, seeing the glow of, glow of camp burning, and knowing that a lot of uh, refu- or all the refugees were gonna be homeless. And if you wanna see actually more pictures of that, I don't have them here, but you could look at uh, I-58 or Your Relief's Instagram or Facebook pages, and they have all of those, um, a lot of good pictures of that. <coughs> Here's another picture of it burning more early in the morning. And um, here is camp after it burned down, as you can see, um, completely destroyed. And there's, there is a little bit of talk about rebuilding it, but um, yeah, there is nothing that they could do. And so um, that uh, maybe. Here's New Rivals, where I worked. Um, see all the, everything's trashed up. They broke in and stole everything when they realized it was burning. Uh, there's the tent that the boys would have stayed in, um, for the most part. It's completely burnt down. Um, yeah. And then this is out on the streets. Um, this is probably three days after the fire burnt, and you can already see uh, people are building structures and bamboo structures and stuff. They're super resourceful people. Um, tents are set up along the road. So yeah, just a few days after that and they're already building building themselves houses and shelter and stuff. So very resourceful. Um, and so I'm gonna kinda go through kinda how the food distro distribution went. This is, uh, Nate is giving us a briefing. This is kinda how briefings looked in the morning. We would meet at the at the parking lot in our town at about 11 o'clock, package food up until about two o'clock, and then we would drive in and distribute the food, and I'll kind of explain how that went. But the first day of distribution, uh, simply we loaded a bunch of vans full of water. We took all the seats out, loaded everything full of water, and uh, originally we had about six to seven vans, and by the end of us loading it, we had about 16 to 17 vans, just random organizations and people would come and with their vans and say that they wanted to help. And so we loaded their van full of water and sent them in. Um, but yeah, basically the refugees were staying in this little sectioned off area of road in, in between two police checkpoints. And so we would drive in the one side and everybody would go to a certain place where their van would, would turn around. And you had a driver and two people in the back. And you would turn around and uh, and here's all the water in the back. You turn around, open up the back, and just start kind of passing out the back. And if you as a driver would stop, your van would get mobbed. Uh, everybody would surround you, and you couldn't go anywhere. And so as a driver, you had to keep, keep driving and keep going, um, try not to run over people and hit other vans and making sure your volunteers are still in the back. But uh, often, um, actually, with our van, I looked back the one time, and... The two volunteers were back there and probably about six other uh, refugees were in the back with us. And they were helping pass out the water, so we didn't care that they were back there. But, but yeah, very loaded down van at that point. Um, yeah, that was a very hectic water distribution. And after, and after that, we went back in with food. Didn't do it the same way, but we tried to distribute food there too. And that actually ended in evacuation. We weren't able to distribute all the food or much of the food because we got mobbed very quickly. And after this day of being on our feet for hours and hours, the cold pavement felt really nice. Um, and this is kind of <clears throat> the system that we got down for food distribution as uh, we would stand in line, at, at kind of assembly line, package food, and there'd be two meals in a bag. Um, and we would just pack until about two o'clock. And then there'd be people that stayed back and continued to pack <clears throat> and there would be people that go in with the vans and distribute it. And so this is us packaging it, this food, this tons of food. This would be all the food that the Greeks would bring, that the Greek company would bring. Um, this is the back of the van, how the back of the vans would usually look. We would just load them full uh, with water on the one side, food on the other. Um, and this is kind of how the, how the 
distribution went, we would go in and we would park three vans uh, side by side. So the women's line would come in this way and then the men's line would come in this one. Um, and as you can see, it's a very hectic mess uh, when we would first start. And then they would come through and basically two lines, you, you would just give them, a, give them a couple waters and give them a, <clears throat> a bag and send them on their way. And then they would exit uh, the other way. And then they would exit on this side. So, so then they would walk that way on that side. And then you'd have your coordinators and translators up on top uh, talking to the people, telling them what's up, stuff like that. Uh, this is this side. So as you can see, the lines going in through the van. Um, and this is, there's no women line at this point. I guess it's done. But as you can see, the within like a couple days, the refugees learned that one, we had enough food for everybody, and two, single line, uh, or like a single file line makes, makes the day go a lot, a lot faster. And so they learned very quickly that not to bunch up, and that was a big problem that we had like the first couple days is they would all bunch up at the front, and they wouldn't wanna give up their spot in line and go farther back. Um, and so it would create a big mess, and uh, it would slow things down a lot. So they learned very quickly to single file line. And this is a good, good picture of how, how it looked. It's so like, as you can see, the women's line is doing a lot better than the men's line. Usually, usually that was the case. Um, and so you'd have people on each side of the men's line um, or volunteers on each side of the men's line trying to keep them in single file, um, which didn't always work. And this line would go back for back here is a camp or another refugee camp back here for vulnerable people. And then there's a store back in here and the line was all the way back at the store. So it was a very long line. Um, and then of course you'd have on this side, you'd have kind of like buffer zones. You have lines of volunteers that would keep people, keep the refugees from coming, coming in and trying to cut in line. And then you'd also have just people walking up and down the line looking for people trying to cut in line and if they saw people cut in line they were just you would pull them out and send them to the back of the line and that was usually a big big trick but yeah here you can see the two lines of volunteers and then one line of refugees going in he's a very happy guy right now um yeah then you just had the translators on top and actually it got to the point a lot of times it was so calm and so and working so good that one translator would be, uh, he was telling jokes on top of the van with, the, with his loudspeaker, telling jokes. He, he started singing the one time. Uh, so yeah, it was a very, it, so it got very, um, yeah, you had fun with it. Um, this is the new campsite. <clears throat> Since the old camp burned down and not a lot of hope of rebuilding a new one, this is uh, the new campsite where the new one is. Um, so all the organizations got together. Uh, the Greek ministry asked them to come in and help uh, them build a new campsite. And um, this is the area that they chose, but we all met at the airport. And not every year relief volunteer went. I think we sent about six. Um, I, was, I was one of them that went. And since the roads were all blocked off, um, the only way to get us there was to chopper us in, which was really fun. Um, but yeah, so we, we choppered in, landed on top of the hill, and started building tents that day. We started probably around 11 o'clock and a very, very hot day. The Greek summers are very hot and not a lot of wind um, or cloud cover. And so we built about 41 tents the first day, which was really a lot more than we thought we would get done. And then by the end of the day, uh, we, the, the Greek military was there. We showed the Greek military how to build the tents and then they started building 24 seven until, uh, until camp was built. This is kind of us building the first tents. Um, and, th and these are the type of tents that most of, most of camp was, these UN tents. And they're probably about eight to 10 people um, you could fit. Since we didn't have a lot of tents and we had a lot of people to put in these tents, we normally put about two families in each of these tents. So if those of you parents who have three kids, you would get half of this tent. Um, Probably, so yeah, be thankful for what you have, I guess. Um, and it was very, very close together, very spread out. Um, and this was just all of camp right here. Uh, I put this picture in, it's a very bad quality picture, but one of the volunteers was leaving and he took this picture on the plane. Um, and this right here is the camp as it, oh, after it was built. That's a very bad quality. It's a lot better on here. 
Um, anyways, this is kind of the, the sec so the, like the front gate would be down here, and then this is the area that you saw in the first picture, and then camp stretched all the way back into here, um, just tent after tent after tent. Um, yeah, and as soon as the first few tents were built, your relief was already inside of camp building uh, or housing people into the tents. They usually, they housed about 300 people in a day probably um, in the first few days. And then the Greek police decided to start uh, persuading people to go into camp. And when they started doing that with their persuasion tactics, there's probably about upwards to 2,000 people being housed a day. And they got them housed in about five days probably, or three to five days. Everybody was inside of camp. This is a better view of camp, um, how camp kind of looked. But then, of course, it stretched off into the into this side of the hill, too. And these are the big rub halls where all the single men would be would stay. Um, camp does look different at this point now, but this is how it first looked. Camp, they've been doing a lot of remodeling in the camp over the past couple months since I've left. Um, so yeah, this is, camp was up and running within a f about a week, week and a half of when the fire was burnt or when the fire burnt the old camp. And so when it first started, uh, all that they had was porta potties for the bathrooms and no showers. If you wanted to shower, you either poured a bottle of water over you or you went and took a bath in the sea. And that was what a lot of them did. They do have showers now. Uh, it's um, a lot better of a camp after the first couple rains. Um, yeah, more pictures of camp. Um, yeah, even after like a few days, people were bringing, or refugees were bringing in gravel to make their house, make their tents better and finding pallets to put under their tent. Uh, this is a good, good view of a half of a tent. Um, so yeah, you families of five, that's what you would get probably. Families of four to five, you'd probably get that. We had cases where there were two families of six living in one tent. Uh, we were trying to f get it worked out, but that would be your half. And of course, you'd have some porch space too to store some stuff, but that's probably where you'd sleep with your kids. And then just one sheet in the middle with uh, a random couple on the other side. Nobody know. yeah, you, you wouldn't know them, but you were housed together. Um, <clears throat> this is really just your relief building some tents, start of camp. Um, also, when, when you were sent out on a job to move a family to a different tent, you're typically gonna move all of your stuff, all of their stuff, all of their luggage that they have. And it was usually several trips, several trips that you had to, had to use. And the first time that it rained, um, everything was flooded. This is the tent that your relief was using for their, uh, or for their information point, for their office, kind of. And it was flooded. I was in the office that day, and my feet were underwater most of the day. I had to dry out my shoes for several days after that. But after that, the Greek military finally realized that camp needs a better drainage system. So they started building, uh, and it, it was probably a couple rains later, uh, a couple of floods later, that they actually started allowing organizations to build trenches and put up sandbags and stuff. So it is a lot better now, but the first while, you had a lot of people displaced because of their tents flooding and stuff like that. And these are the rub halls that the single men would stay in. Um, they would put tents up on top of the bunk beds for better privacy, stuff like that. Um, this is a story I think I'll get into very quickly. I'll just brush through it very quickly, but it's a, it's a pretty big story and it actually means a lot. But uh, <clears throat> so it was close to the beginning of when camp was actually built and uh, me and a couple other people were working on this job. Uh, we had about eight Somalian single women who needed to be like, housed in a tent. Uh, they didn't have a place. And there was a section in camp for single women. Um, and so there's this tent right next to that section that didn't have anybody registered to it. There's nobody registered to it in the system. So we went and looked at it, and here it turns out there are two Syrian families living in it. Uh, two, two families of four living in each side of the, like, each half of it. So we went to uh, another section in camp where there is another Arabic community, and <clears throat> there are two tents right next to each other in this other section with only one family living in each half. And so 
ha like both the halves were open in this on these other two tents, exact same amount of space, <coughs> same amount of room, stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we went and offered them this this tent, told them that you're not supposed to be living here. You're not. You never ask permission, and we have these single people that need this tent. And from the first start of it, I knew it was going to be a no, um, and they refused. So we worked with them for several days, several days, just working with them, trying to get them to, to understand, hey, like, you need to move, you need to move. Probably after about four to five days of working with, the, with these people. And by the way, the Arabics, um, amazing people, but very difficult to, um, to have this kind of a job with. Um, usually, like the Afghans, you can, you can reason with. But um, the Arabics, they, uh, they find their house, and, they, and this is their house. They found it, and this is theirs, and they don't want to give it up. Um, which, is, which is, yeah, like I respect that, and it's really cool. Uh, it just makes it very difficult for housing. <laughs> um, and so basically about four, di four days later after working with them, we told them, that, like, like if you don't move, if, if you don't let us help you move, then we're going to bring the police, and they still didn't move. So we brought the police, and... Usually in the old camp, it would be about four to five police would come with you and just kind of stand behind you and watch you do the work. And this time they brought about 15 police with them. And they, and they had their handcuffs with them and they had clubs and stuff. They weren't going to use them. But, um, so, so they started talking again. And we had about one translator that we could use for this entire job. And by the end of this, he, he gave us his badge and he, and he, and, and he walked off. Because he, yeah, he quit your relief because he was done. It was a really hard job for him. Uh, he was back the next day, though, to get his badge back. But, um, but yeah, so the police worked with him for, for a while. And finally, the police just started moving their stuff. And we had a box truck there. And the one guy just grabbed his kids, put, put the coat on, their ki on his kids, and grabbed his wife and just walked. And they left camp, and they went out on the streets. Um, so we loaded his stuff up into the box truck. We had showed them the, the other tents, we loaded his stuff up in the box truck. And then the other guy, uh, the police handcuffed and walked away because he was remo like refusing to move. And then typical Greek fashion, he was out of handcuffs in about five minutes and he was back <laughs> in, uh, in his tent. So we moved all of his stuff finally into the box truck. And this is us in the box truck with all of their stuff going to the second tents to just put their stuff in. And when we got to the second tents, the, uh, the Arabs or the Syrians in, that, in those tents refused to let anybody into their tent, into their other half of tent. And by that time, the, the police had just had it, and, <laughs> and a lot of shouting went on, and finally we, we moved their stuff into their tent. And it was probably, I don't know, the shift would have got done usually around 4 o'clock. It was probably after 8 till we got done with this job. So it was a very long job. Um, but a lot of good memories made with that. And yeah, that was kind of a typical housing job <laughs> with, with uh, in the new camp. This is how info was for the, for the first couple months. We do now have offices that, that, that we moved in um, that we can lock. So you would have to load up everything in, in the office every night and then every morning you would take it all back and put all the tables back up and the generator and everything like that and um so yeah it took about a half hour to clean everything up and stuff like that but that's where we would work out of and this was my job i was housing assistant um kind of the housing coordinator would do all the big coordinating and the housing assistant would do the daily coordinating so volunteers would come to me and i would give them jobs to go move this family or this, like offer this family this tent and stuff like that. Um, and so that was, that was the job that I had. And, and I worked about three days doing that and then two days out actually working in camp doing, doing other stuff. Um, probably my favorite Greek meal or Greek meal, uh, Afghan meal. Um, the translators invited a few of us into their tent for, uh, for lunch one day. And that was some good, some good eating right there. Um, and then this is the, the kind of like the last project that we left on or that my team left on. Uh, we were moving all the single men out of tents into these big rub halls and basically what we were doing is building these uh, walls inside of the rub halls for the men so they have a little bit more privacy. You could fit about eight people inside of these uh, rooms and um, yeah, so 
they could choose which men that they wanted to live with, and so that was kind of our final job that we were working on um, when we left, kind of moving a bunch of people around. Um, that's kind of all I have. I did want to close with one little thing um, that a lot of people see the fire as a, as a really bad thing, um, <clears throat> and I kind of do too. I mean, I mean, it was a really bad thing, especially when it happened. A lot of hopeless feelings, especially around volunteers, just because you never knew uh, what was what, like like what was going to happen if you were even going to be allowed to stay on the island or if you were going to be able to work in the new camp. Um, but we had a kind of a worship service or or like a worship night, uh, the one night, and one person brought out how how so many prayers were answered uh, after this fire. So, and I actually have a few that I wrote down, and I kind of want to share them with you because a lot of people think. The fire was horrible, and which it was, but nothing good came out of it. But uh, yeah, I think it's cool that uh, to see what God can bring out of a really bad thing. So uh, the first and biggest thing that I think was answered, or big, biggest prayer was answered, was camp. Originally, camp was about five miles from the oasis, um, and now it's within eyesight. If you're staying in camp, you can see the oasis right across the street probably about a 10, 15 minute walk to the Oasis, um, if the Oasis, or when the Oasis opens back up after COVID. Um, so that, so yeah, that was one prayer that was answered. It's a lot easier to access the, the Oasis now. Um, also, the new camp is much safer. There's a lot more police presence and just not as many stabbings, uh, not, a, not as many robberies and stuff happen a lot safer in camp. In the old camp, you, it was not uncommon to walk into camp in the morning and see a blood trail going from the ga- gate uh, to, the, to the doctor from somebody that got stabbed. The Afghans and the Somalians would always be fighting and stuff. And so, yeah, that was just not uncommon, in, or not common, not uncommon. And then in the new camp, just none of that happened. There'd, there'd be a few incidents, but the police were there right away uh, to, to deal with it. Um, all of the minor boys, all of the miners, were transferred off the island the day after the fire, and so there are no more minor boys. They were transferred to a lot more safer places in, in Athens, and a lot of the single women, the vulnerable women, got transferred off too. And so that was also a big blessing and a big prayer that was answered, that they were either transferred to Athens, into Europe, or into Mytilene, to like hotels that were still a lot safer than camp. Um, whereas still a lot of single women were in camp, but many were transferred off or out. Um, And then a lot of refugees were able to see um, our love and our devotion to them and to God um, through this time, because a lot of organizations after the fire decided we're done, we're leaving, uh, because they weren't really there for the right reasons anyways, but yet they saw your relief stick around, and the day after the fire, all all these Christians were out trying to get them food and trying to get them water and trying to get them shelter. So it's kind of a way to show um, them our love to both them and and to God um, through a really rough time for everybody, for all of us. And also it's just, it it was really the prayer of um, just trying to grow closer to God, that was answered. Everybody involved in that was just really uh, strengthened, like, like their faith was strengthened, their trust in God was strengthened, and the devotion to him was strengthened, just seeing how much he cares not only about the big situation that's happening, but also your own feelings about that situation. Um, how you feel toward that situation, that, that was strengthened. Uh, or, yeah, your faith in God was just really strengthened during that time. Um, that is all I have. Before I open it up for questions, I would like to advertise this book. Um, if any of you guys want a really good book about Moria and about um, the entire, yeah, just like the whole life of Moria, uh, look up Unprepared for Moria uh, online, on, and I can have this book sitting up here if you wanted to snap a picture of it. It's got bunches of pictures and stuff, um, and a lot of, lot of writing, a lot of stories. Uh, it's where I got some of the stories that I read here tonight. Um, so yeah, if you want to check this out, it's a, it's a great book um, online. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? You mentioned the fact that the Greek government was doing some of this, but for instance, the picture behind you, who was paying for all of that? Um, so there is a Greek, or, or I think it was a Greek organization um, called IOM, 
and they were they were there, and these rub halls or like these tents that is inside of here, were um, those were their their rub halls, and I'm not sure where they got their funding. It might have been the Greek government, um, but yeah, that this was their rub halls, and there are actually like partitions that come with the rub halls that we were originally supposed to get, but then they kind of backed out of it, and so then they funded us getting these, uh, the lumber and the plywood and stuff for this. Um, that your food and the clothes and things that you were passing out? The um, the cl so the clothes would be donated. Um, I think there'd be various uh, like warehouses up in Europe, and I think a lot of them come from the Netherlands, um, where a lot of the clothes would just be donated to your relief, and then truckers would truck them down to Athens, and then they'd be sent over on ferries. And um, as far as the food goes, the food was paid for by the Greek government. Uh, it was the there would be like a Greek catering company that they pay every every day to make food and drive it into camp, and then an organization would be would uh, would uh, distribute that to everybody, and 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 they had their own systems for that. But and I think where I think that's a lot of the reason why Greece is in such an economical bind that they're in is because one they have they have this crisis and they have to put all their funding towards this and then uh, the UN tries to fund them a little bit but the the UN just hasn't really helped them out too much uh, during this whole time so yeah Um, before I close, actually, one more thing that I wanted to do. Um, I'm not going to talk about I-58. I kind of want to explain their, uh, the reason they're called I-58. And they originally were thinking about being called I-60, but um, they read I Isaiah 58. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to it. If you don't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, I'm just going to read that quick, read this quick. And it's just, it's a really good chapter, one of my favorite chapters now. Um, of why I-58 is doing what they're doing and why they went over there in the first place. Um, and I'm just going to start at verse 6 because that's really when it gets into it. And I'm going to read it in ESV. Um, I think it goes a little bit better. Is this not the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then you shall, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring, spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from the mist, and the pointing of the finger, and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, of the afflicted then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like the watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt, and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of, of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight in the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it and not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talk, talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I think that's just a really good passage about yeah why why I fifty eight does what they do, and why they originally started. Um, I believe there are snacks outside, out in the cabin. I don't actually know. But, uh, yeah, that's all I have. There's no other questions. Um, everybody can stand. <laughs>